thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Uh, good uh, morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Paulius. I am the managing director of the Center for Social Norms and Behavioral Dynamics at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, and welcome to another of our NOVEC talks. Uh, today, we will have a very similar agenda to previous uh, sessions. Um, I will give a very short uh, welcome message. Uh, then we will have our early career researcher pre-recorded video uh, for today, which is um, Elena Julia Clemente from the Stockholm School of Economics and the Swedish House of Finance. And then we will have our main speaker for today, which is Professor Marie-Claire Villeval from the National Center of Scientific Research in France. And at the end, as always, we will have 15 minutes for uh, questions. A small reminder, as I always do as well, that uh, the Novak uh, Talk speaker series is organized by our Penn Center for Social Norms and Behavioral Dynamics. We are a research center at the University of Pennsylvania that does consulting, research, and training to enable organizations um, to sustainably enact positive behavioral change. Uh, you have here our webpage and a QR code that takes you to our Twitter account um, to learn more about what we do. And uh, the second reminder is about our fall programming. Um, if you visit novetalks.com or follow this QR code, you can see um, the full uh, programming and also all our previous videos. Um, basically, we have two uh, talks left this year. Uh, one next week, which will be the, the working paper series launch that was canceled before. We will do it next week. Uh, also on Thursday, the same time, the same link. And then on December 16, we will have uh, Stefan Meyer from the Columbia Business School. So as always, you will get all the reminders um, in your email and in our webpage as well. Um, a few ground rules also the same as in previous sessions. Uh, please mute yourself during the talk. Um, if you want, if you can, please keep your camera on so that we have a more interactive experience. If you want, um, it's nice when people um, change their username to reflect where they are coming from, just to get an idea. Um, and then you can ask always questions in the chat at any time. We have a co-author in the audience, as in previous occasions, or you can also raise the hand um, at the end in the last 15 minutes. Um, we, we are transmitting live on Facebook, so the video will be there. And next week, the recording of this session will be added to our website, um, as are all the previous uh, videos. And with that, I'm going to play um, in a minute the early career researcher presentation of this week. As I mentioned before, um, this time we will have Elena Julia Clemente, a pre-doctoral research analyst at the so Stockholm School of Economics and the Swedish House of Finance. Uh, the presentation is called Politizing Mask Wearing, Predicting the Success of Behavioral Interventions Among Republicans and Democrats. If you follow uh, this QR code, uh, and we will paste the link in the chat as well, uh, you can see the, the paper. And the video uh, will also be on uh, our website. So just one minute, I'm going to play the video now. Hi, everyone. My name is Elena Clemente, and I'm a research assistant at the Stockholm School of Economics. Today, I'm going to talk about our paper about predicting the success of behavioral interventions. Our paper builds on a companion paper by Michelle Galvin and co-authors, which you may have seen in a separate presentation. 
Their paper evaluates the effectiveness of seven nudge interventions on Republicans and Democrats in a representative U.S. sample. They measure four outcomes relative to a control baseline condition, including attitudes and intentions towards mask wearing and two behavioral tasks. They find that Republicans hold more negative attitudes and behavior towards mask wearing. However, none of the seven interventions were effective at promoting uh, mask wearing among either sample of people. Building on these results, we ask whether academics, behavioral scientists, and uh, lay people can accurately forecast the effectiveness of um, each of the seven nudges. Uh, recent literature sh has shown the importance of collecting predictions for scientific outcomes. However, there is limited evidence on different uh, types of forecasters, since most of these studies include only uh, scientists and academics. And um, this is one of the first examples where they have to predict separately for Republicans and Democrats in the same context. Before running our forecasting survey, we pre-registered our hypothesis on the Open Science Framework. We collected data for a lay people sample uh, through Qualtrics to match US demographics and political affiliations. And um, data for practitioners and academics were, um, was collected through academic mailing list and social media. And then additional uh, behavioral scientist data was collected from our um, UNIS partners. As a final sample, we got to more than 1,000 forecasters, including more than uh, 50 participants for each of the three subgroups. In the forecasting survey, the participants were shown each of the um, seven nudge messages, uh, as well as the baseline message. And they were then asked to predict uh, both of them for, separately for each of the four outcomes. Uh, in terms of currency. And they were also asked to predict separately by the political affiliation of the person that was subject to the nudge, so either a Democrat or a Republican. In total, they provided 64 forecasts and some additional demographic items. Our first primary hypothesis was that there will be a positive relationship between uh, predicted and realized effect sizes. We find that um, Participants are able to predict the baseline conditions very well. However, their uh, predictions for nudge effects are only loosely correlated with the realized results. The graph shows the average forecast and observed effect size for each of the 64 um, predictions that they were asked to make separately for Republicans and Democrats. We also find um, slightly negative uh, and significant correlation between them uh, for between forecasted and uh, observed effect sizes for Democrats only. Um, our second and third hypothesis was that um, participants would predict the different effect sizes for uh, Democrats and Republicans, and they would have uh, different accuracies based on who they were predicting about. And our fourth hypothesis was that forecasters uh, would either under or overestimate the observed notch effects. The graph shows um, uh, each effect size, both uh, forecasted and observed for um, the seven nudge effects, uh, as well as separately for Republicans and Democrats. We find that um, participants do expect nudges to work differently for Republicans and Democrats. And in particular, they um, over predict the effect that they would have on Democrats, but not on Republicans. And they also show um, lower accuracy when predicting uh, results for them. Finally, our last hypothesis was that the accuracy of predictions would differ among uh, lay people, academics, and practitioners. We find that lay people have uh, show um, higher prediction error or lower accuracy than either practitioners or academics. However, uh, the difference between practitioners and academics is not significant. Overall, we find that participants do expect nudges to work differently on Democrats and Republicans, and they overestimate the impact that these would have on Democrats. We also find differences in forecasting abilities across the three groups of forecasters. However, none of them were able to predict that um, the nudge interventions would have no effect on mask wearing. We argue that understanding differences in uh, forecasting abilities can help uh, policymakers avoid costly pu public interventions. And we provide an example of how a collaboration with behavioral science units can improve policy recommendations. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions or feedback, you can write me an email. And this is the link to our paper.
Great. Thank you so much to Elena for the presentation. Um, unfortunately, Elena couldn't join us today, but we have a uh, co-author uh, Dylan in the audience. So if you have any questions or comments or, or you'd like to connect, please write uh, in the chat as we've done before. Uh, we unfortunately don't have uh, time for live questions, but feel free to write anything in the chat. Um, with that, I am introducing today's uh, main speaker, uh, Professor Marie-Claire Villeval. Um, the talk is called Teaching Norms, Direct Evidence of Parental Transmission. Uh, and Professor Marie-Claire Villeval is a research professor in economics at the French National Center for Scientific Research and the director of the Gate Lab at the University of Lyon in France. She is the president of the Economic Science Association and a fellow of the European Association of Labour Economists. And she has been awarded the silver medal of the um, National Center for Scientific Research in 2017. Uh, her main research interests focus on experimental economics, behavioral economics, public economics, and personnel economics, and she mainly conducts laboratory and field experiments on topics like dishonesty, ethical behavior, incentives, information, and social preferences. Um, yeah, just a small note, you might um, notice that, that the title of the talk was uh, different from the one that we had advertised um, earlier this uh, year. Um, yeah, so, but it's, um, it's a new uh, project. Um, and as a moderator, we will have again Dr. Oidon Demand, which is an associate professor of practice in behavioral and decision sciences here at Penn and a core member of our center. So, with that, thank you so much, Professor Villeval, for joining us. And Thank you very much for, uh, for your invitation. Uh, thank you very much for your kind introduction, Paulius. Um, I'm really delighted to give this, uh, this presentation uh, in the NOBEC uh, seminar uh, to this audience of experts on social norms. Uh, this is really a great pleasure. So thank you very much. Uh, this is a paper um, on uh, the field experiment on teaching norms. And we are looking at how parents teach norms to their, to their children. And this is joint work with uh, Teich Brewer from Tilburg and uh, Fabio Galeotti, who is uh, online today with us. And so uh, please ask your questions and Fabio and I will be very happy to, uh, to answer your, your question. So I hope you can see my, my screens. Uh, okay, so uh, of course I, I don't have to convince you that social norms uh, play a, a very important role in our uh, economic life, social life, uh, because uh, they provide shared understanding of uh, what is appropriate to do, what is not appropriate to do. But um, in many situations, in fact, uh, there, there may be uh, uh, multiple social norms or uh, some uncertainty about which social norm uh, applies. And, and so in many cases, you, you need to, to learn uh, what the social norm is. And think, for example, of the current pandemic, uh, we had to learn uh, new norms, new ways of uh, behaving in society. And when you travel, you also have to learn the different norms, etc. So. Uh, it's very frequent that you are not sure about which norm uh, applies. And so you are uh, frequently in a situation in which you have to learn. And so the, the, the question we are interested in this paper is uh, how, or how are norms internalized and transmitted? And um, th there is a large literature on norm compliance. There's a lot of papers on um, uh, norm enforcement, but the literature on uh, norm transmission is uh, much, uh, much smaller, especially in economics. And in fact, there are three main channels for the transmission of norms. The first channel is 
just the observation of the success of compliers compared to the success rate of non-compliers. So this is the first source of information. The second channel is uh, the, the fact that we experience ourselves the, the punishment if we, if we deviate from the social norm. If we violate a norm, it's likely that at some point we will be sanctioned by others. So this personal experience is a second channel of, of uh, learning norms. The third channel is the observation of others enforcing norms. And frequently, even if you are not directly involved in a, a punishment situation, you can observe other people who enforce the social norm. And this also uh, teaches you something about the social norm uh, in use in a, in a given circumstance. And we may think that the, the, the first uh, source of uh, learning or, or, or training um, in the domain of social norms is uh, when parents uh, teach their child how to behave and how not to behave. And it's clear that parents have a, a very important role in the vertical transmission of social norms, uh, both uh, through the example they give but also when they enforce the social norm in the presence of their children. And um, uh, for example, uh, developmental psychologists have shown that uh, uh, the, the parents have a very important role in, in the socialization process of, of the children. And so the, it's often called the vicarious learning. You know, the children acquire social behavior through the observation and through the imitation of others, in particular through the imitation of their parents. And it, it, it's okay when the parents give uh, good examples, but sometimes the parents also give bad examples. And this may uh, create some important issues uh, if uh, children uh, have not received the right example from their parents. And uh, you, you, could, you could consider that in this domain, the, the parents, they, they lead by example, and they also lead by sacrifice. They lead by example by displaying the, the, the desired behavior in front of their children, and they lead by sacrifice when uh, punishing non-violations, because usually there is a cost for, for punishing violators. And so by these two types of leadership, the, the parents help uh, children to uh, socialize and to interiorize, interiorize the, the, the social norms. Of course, there is already a literature on this, uh, on, on this uh, topic, uh, but in economics, uh, this literature, for example, on the, on the um, uh, non-cognitive skills in children, this uh, literature is focusing more on the correlation between the, the, the parents and the, and the children's preferences, more than on the socialization of, of parents uh, itself. Uh, there are now many, many papers looking at this correlation uh, of preferences in the domain of time or patience or social preferences. Um, these studies have also shown that the correlation between the, the parents and the children's preferences is usually higher uh, when the parents spend more time or invest more effort in the education of their children. So the, the parenting style influence the, the size or the strength of the correlation between the, the, the parents and the children's preferences. What we are doing in our study is different because we are, we are not so much interested in the correlation of preferences we are really interested in the transmission process of social norms. So we, of course, we are related to this literature, but we are doing something very different. We share uh, the, 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 this interest for transmission with a few other uh, authors who looked at the transmission of preferences from parents to children, especially uh, transmission of generosity or transmission of honesty. But most of the time in these papers, they look at how adults change behavior when they know they are observed by children. What we are doing again is different. Uh, we are not so much or not only interested in how parents model the children's behavior, 
we are more interested in how parents teach norm compliance and norm enforcement to their, to their children. And moreover, we do that in a natural setting, while these uh, previous experiments um, usually use field or lab experiments. In our case, um, uh, the, the participants don't know they are taking part in an experiment. So we, we have two main questions, in fact, in this study. Uh, but before I show the, the, the question, let me insist on the fact that we are interested in parental transmission, but we only look at the first step. I mean, how parents teach social norms. We do not investigate the second step, how children learn from the parental transmission. So we only look at the first part of the process. Huh? And regarding this first part, uh, our first question is, do parents engage more in norm enforcement when their child is present? So specifically, are, are they more willing to enforce a norm by punishing violators when the child is present? So are they, are they, are they using norm enforcement to teach their child that some uh, misbehavior or misconduct has to be punished. And if this is the case, it could inform us on how social norms are passed on from a generation to the next one. We have a second question. And the second question is, uh, perhaps parents don't enforce more the norm, but uh, perhaps they use different ways of teaching or different ways of punishing norm violators to teach their children. So usually we, we oppose uh, direct and indirect punishment. Here we would like to know whether parents are more likely to use indirect punishment uh, instead of direct punishment when their child is present. Because it's possible that you fear more retaliation in the presence of your children. And so it's possible that the way you are willing to teach norm, norm enforcement uh, differs when your child is, is, is observing you. Just let me briefly uh, remind you the different ways of, uh, of punishing non-violators. The, the most natural one is direct punishment. And direct punishment is simply the verbal expression uh, of disapproval to, to the violator. So we, um, in doing so, we explicitly teach the child uh, that uh, someone is violating a norm, that someone is misbehaving, and this person has to be punished. This is okay. The problem is that um, there is a risk of retaliation uh, when you uh, use direct punishment. And you may fear this risk even more when the child is observing the situation. And because of this risk of retaliation, we know from previous literature that uh, in real life, uh, very few people, in fact, uh, implement direct punishment. Compared to the lab, in, in the lab, we, we see a lot of, uh, of sanctioning. But in the field, it's only a, a small proportion of people who are explicitly, uh, directly punishing normal violators. So in the initial field experiment of Balafutas and, and Niki Forakis, they found that only 4% of people in the subway were willing to punish uh, people who violated the non-littering norm. So it's, it's very few. So uh, since direct punishment may entail retaliation, uh, people may switch to indirect punishment. And typically, indirect punishment is through um, withholding help. So if someone has violated a norm and subsequently uh, needs some help, you will be less likely to help this person who has violated the norm before. And the, the previous uh, studies on this topic show that this indirect punishment is more frequent that, than the direct one. So people tend to substitute. So again, citing uh, Balafutas, Nikiforakis, and uh, Bettina Rickenbach, uh, they found that when people can substitute uh, indirect punishment for direct punishment, they find that 
only 19% of people are willing to help a violator who needs some help, compared to more than 40% when a person needs help without having violated the norm before. So people uh, withhold help to punish the violator. And so these two uh, ways are, are, are substitutes. Now, in the presence of a child, it's a bit more complicated uh, because to some extent, there is a kind of conflict between two norms because you, you want to teach a child that a violation has to be punished. So you want to punish, but at the same time, uh, if you use indirect punishment, you withhold help. And it goes in contradiction with another norm that you want to teach to your child. And this is a norm that uh, it's good to help people who, who need help. So if you use uh, indirect punishment, it may conflict with the willingness to teach the helping norm. And so it's less clear what will happen uh, when a child is present. Of course, there are other ways of teaching norms. You can think of uh, indirect reprimand, for example. So typically, uh, you, 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 you say something negative about the, 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 the violation of the norm. You can address a child. You can tell the child, look, this person is doing something bad. And you say it aloud such that uh, the violator can hear you. But you do not talk directly to the violator. So it's kind of indirect recruitment. Um, you, can, you can pick up the litter yourself. Uh, I mean, if someone is littering, you can do it. Your, you can pick the litter and show the, 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 the child that uh, indeed you shouldn't litter. It's OK. It's a way of teaching the social norm. But it's a bit, a bit ambiguous because in, you, you do not teach that violators have to be punished when they violate the norm. So it, it says nothing about the teaching, uh, teaching compliance, teaching uh, enforcement. And the last way of teaching norms to the child is to explain to the child in private the situation. Uh, again, it may be good to teach compliance, but in that case, there is no sanction of the violator. And so it doesn't teach the, the child that violations have to be punished. So it's less complete than the direct and indirect sanctions that I mentioned before. So in our study, we, we clearly focus on direct and indirect punishment. Uh, we measure indirect reprimand and pick up litter because we need to control for these uh, other ways of, of punishing violations. And of course, we cannot say anything about a direct explanation in private to the child. So this part may affect our results, but we cannot say anything about, about it. So the, the approach that we implemented to address our two questions was uh, designing a field experiment that we conducted in the vicinity of primary schools in Lyon. And uh, the idea was to, um, to, to measure, to collect data on the reaction of parents observing a violation of the non littering norm by someone and measuring the, the, the reaction of these parents and uh, depending on whether these parents were accompanied by the, the child or were alone. So I will, I will give you all the details of the design, of course. But before I show you the, the design, uh, why did we choose littering? Well, we chose littering because simply because people care about that. Um, th 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 there was um, a, a poll with a representative sample of the French population that was conducted a few years ago. And um, the respondents could see a list of uh, known violations and they had to report whether they found each item appropriate or inappropriate. And you see that the first three um, items here are related to, uh, to littering. So the, 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 the behavior that people found the most um, disgusting, the most inappropriate was uh, littering in public space, uh, littering after a picnic, uh, dumping uh, uh, bulky items uh, uh, on the street, etc. And these uh, 
um, uh, type of misbehavior were ranked higher than other types of violations like uh, speeding on the highway, uh, speeding on the, on the street, uh, 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 making noise, uh, etc. So really littering is considered as, as a, the, the, the most inappropriate, inacceptable uh, behavior. And the second interesting finding from this poll was uh, the fact that uh, people were asked to uh, indicate which intervention they thought was the most effective against littering. And the first intervention was um, educating children. This is ranked higher than uh, increasing sanctions or fines. Uh, it was higher than uh, giving more information to people, um, introducing stricter regulations, etc. So really, people don't like littering, not lit non-littering, uh, uh, and they think that education is the most important way to deal with uh, the violation of this type of norms. And so this is what, what, what we are doing in this study. Uh, we simply provide parents with an opportunity to enforce a norm of non-littering, either directly or indirectly. And we targeted similar people, similar parents. But the only difference between these parents was that in one case, they were alone. In the other case, they were with a child. And to um, introduce a shock, to introduce a norm violation, we recruited professional actors, one male and one female actor, and we asked them to uh, violate the non-littering norm. And we, we used actors, we used actors because uh, we wanted that the scene was staged exactly the same way in a very limited amount of time. And we wanted people who would be blind to the purposes of our study. And it's clear that if we um, violated the norm ourselves, uh, it could have biased the, the measure. So we wanted to have actors for that reason. So let and me- Sam, just real quick, Christina, Christina wants to interject a question. Yes, Christina, sure. go ahead. Uh, sorry, I want to ask a question at the end. I was telling you, not immediately. I want to see how it evolves. Sorry, right. I will ask okay. a question at the end. Thank you. Okay, with pleasure. So we, 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 let, let, let's look at the design. So we, we randomly selected 30 primary schools in Lyon, only public schools. And we, we targeted the parents uh, approaching school or uh, leaving school in the morning and in the afternoon. And so the idea is that it's, it's really the same parents. The difference is that we observe parents who bring their, their kid at school and we observe parents who have just dropped off their, their kid at school uh, in the morning. And in the afternoon, we observe parents who come to school to pick up their kid and parents who leave the, 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 the school after picking up their kid. But these are clearly the same parents, okay? And so we, 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 we played this scene uh, in the morning uh, around 8, uh, 8 30 in the morning, and in the afternoon, around 4, 4 30 to 50, 50, 50 30. Sorry. Um, so these parents are really similar people. They all have a kid going to that school. Okay. We excluded a, a number of uh, cases. So uh, we excluded parents who were pushing strollers or who were holding bags or who were visibly in a rush or who were talking on the phone because we wanted people who paid attention and people for which the cost of helping, the cost of uh, enforcing the norm was very minimal, okay? And so the, the actor was instructed uh, which scene to play uh, next before we identify the next target. So the design is very uh, close to that of Balafutas, Nikiforakis, and Rothenbach in their PNS paper. So we have the actor. The actor holds a plastic bag, and we have put uh, uh, food waste in this bag. 
And the actor also carries a shoulder a cotton bag that contains folders, pens. The actor approaches uh, the target parent from the front. We target the people when there is not people around. I mean, not, not many people around that would be able to intervene in the scene. At 10 meters away, the actor stops, poses, and goes through the bag. And at five meters away, the actor starts playing the scene. And there are, in fact, three different scenes that correspond to the three different treatments. Violation plus L, violation, and L. I will describe this uh, treatment. Just let me show you the materials that we used in the in the in the experiment so you see the plastic bag the food waste it was a banana peel uh, we have the the, the the cotton bag the folders etc and the actress okay so the, the, the first scene is a violation plus l so the actor clearly explicitly intentionally throw the waste on the ground away from the child of course huh? but it must be in clear sight of the target so the, she, 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 throw the, the, she throws the, the plastic bag with a banana peel inside. Then she moves again while taking out the content of the bag and accidentally she drops the content of the bag on the ground. And she waits a few seconds before starting to collect the, to pick up the, the objects. So this gives an opportunity for the parent who observes the scene to say something, to express disapproval, for the, the littering by the actor, or helping or not helping the, the actor or the actress. The violation um, condition is the same at the beginning. So the actor, again, uh, intentionally throw the, the, the plastic bag on the ground. But in that case, there is no, uh, it doesn't drop or she doesn't drop the content of her bag. So it's a pure violation condition. And here we can measure whether the parent directly expresses verbally uh, his or her disapproval to the actor. And we have the help condition in which there is no norm violation, but the actor simply drops the content of the bag. Uh, we needed this treatment because we need to have the helping rate, the baseline helping rate when there is no norm violation, so that we can um, measure the impact of the violation on the helping rate, which will give us a measure of indirect punishment. Uh, we had two uh, research assistants helping us for this um, uh, experiment. So the first research assistant had to take notes, uh, observing the scene from distance, and taking notes about the reaction of, of the parent, making sure that the parent was looking at the actor when the actor threw the plastic bag. Uh, we, he took note of the, the number of witnesses, of the weather, etc. And we had a second array who conducted a short, apparently unrelated survey uh, about the quality of the environment. And this second RA approached the, the parent after the, the actor played the scene and uh, asking the, the, the parent a few questions. And the objective for us was to collect additional information to know whether this adult was the actual parent of the child or simply a relative or simply uh, was a nanny because it's possible that uh, we, we, we had no specific hypothesis on this, but we wanted to control them, huh? because it's possible that someone who is not the parent may care less about teaching the social norm to the child. And so we wanted to, to have this additional information and uh, asking the parent um, whether he was accompanying a child or picking up a child in this school, we could also ask for the age of the child, for the gender of the child, etc. So it was an opportunity for us to collect additional information. So uh, to, to recap, we have a three by two design. So one dimension is a three different uh, scenes. 
The second dimension is whether the child is present in the C condition or the parent is alone in the A condition. So in total, we have 600 observations. We have about 100 observations per cell. So as I said before, we, we randomly select the 30 schools. We spend one day in each school, uh, or in front of each school, and we collected about 20 observations per day. We didn't want to stay longer in order not to be uh, identified. And this was pre-registered and we had an IRB approval. Uh, we have a, a number of additional control, uh, the, the family socioeconomic environment, the presence of witnesses, the, the gender of the parent, the child, etc. So just to, to be clear on the definitions, so for helping, so help is coded one if the parent picks at least one item and zero otherwise. A direct punishment is coded one if the parent uh, addresses directly the, the, the actor verbally about the norm violation or uh, asking the actor to pick up his litter or, or by just expressing disapproval. And indirect punishment is not measured at the individual level. It's just given by the comparison between the helping rate in the help condition and in the violation and help condition. So we just measure the impact of the norm violation on helping rate. We, we have uh, three simple conjectures. The, the first conjecture is um, that if we compare the punishment rate when the child is present or, or, or not, uh, this should indicate the willingness of the parent to, to teach a child the, the social norm. And we conjecture, uh, based on parenting model literature, that the direct punishment rate is probably higher when the parent is accompanied with the child than when the parent is alone. And uh, of course, this is assuming that the, uh, the additional benefit of teaching the social norm to the child weights more than the additional costs of um, enforcing the social norm. Uh, of course, uh, if the parents fear more retaliation when the child is present, we may underestimate the teaching motive. Uh, we may underestimate the willingness to teach because in that case, uh, the cost of enforcing the norm may reduce uh, the net benefit of teaching. So we may underestimate the teaching effect. Uh, on the other hand, if the parent believes that the, the risk of retaliation is lower when there is a child present, we may overestimate the teaching motive. Um, we cannot test it directly, but we have with our other treatment, we have a way to uh, provide some information uh, that tend to support in fact a higher fear of retaliation in the presence of the child. I, I will give you some more information later. The second conjecture is about the baseline helping rate. Again, based on the previous literature, we uh, anticipate that parents are more willing to provide help to the actor uh, when the child is present and when no norm was violated before. So we expect that there's no additional cost of helping in the presence of the child, but there is an additional benefit it is teaching the norm. So we expect more, uh, more helping uh, behavior in the presence of the child. The, the last conjecture is that uh, people may be willing to substitute uh, indirect punishment for, for direct punishment if they fear retaliation. And in that case, uh, parents may withhold help more after the violation in the presence of a child compared to when they are alone. Of course, it, it's a bit more complicated because, as I said before, uh, there are conflicting motives between teaching and helping. So the teaching benefits may be lower than uh, in the case of a direct punishment because 
perhaps it's more difficult to grasp for a child that uh, withholding help means punishing a known violator. So it, it may be less clear uh, for, for the children, especially if the child is young. And so it's possible that the, the, the parent may reinforce the behavior by disapproving or adding more a higher expression of, of disapproval if, uh, if he wants to, to reinforce this. Okay. Um, so I don't know if there are uh, questions about the, the design before I, I move to the results. Uh, you got it. You can move on. Yeah. Okay. So the results. Punishment, uh, punishment behavior first, direct punishment. We have only 11% of the, of the parents in the alone condition that are uh, directly punishing the known violator by expressing disapproval. This is not that surprising. Huh? I, I remind you the, the, the four percent punishment rate in the uh, Balafutas and Nikiforakis experiment. So we have 11% it's the same range of, uh, of values. So people punish, but it's not the majority of people. So what happens when the child is present? I said, we have two options. The fear of retaliation may reduce this rate, but the teaching motive may increase the rate. This is a net effect. The, 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 the punishment rate doubles in the presence of the child. It goes from 11% to 22%. So uh, uh, twice more parents are willing to express disapproval of the norm violation when the child is observing them. What happens uh, for helping? So this is a helping rate in the baseline condition without norm violation. In this setting, when the, 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 the target parents are alone, 25% of people are willing to help the actor to pick up the items. What happens when the child is, is present? Again, it doubles. It, it goes from 25 to 47%. And so people are more willing to help. And as I said before, the, the cost of helping is not bigger in the presence of the child, but the teaching benefit is higher. And so they, they are much more willing to, to, to help when there was no violation of norm before. So again, this tends to support the teaching uh, motive. Now, what happens in the violation plus help treatment? So again, I show you the helping rate without prior violation. What happens after a violation? The helping rate decreases significantly when the child is present. So it's only 30% of parents who are willing to help the violator compared to 47 when there was no violation. So clearly they withheld, they withhold uh, help. What happens when they are alone? They also reduce their willingness to help from 25 to 17%, but it's not significantly different. The other uh, information from this uh, figure is that the, the decrease in the helping rate is not significantly different when the child is present compared to when the parent is alone. So this goes against our third conjecture. So they, they withhold help for sure, but not significantly more when the child is present compared to when they are alone. Now, do they substitute indirect punishment for direct punishment? To measure that, we need to look again at the punishment rate. These two bars are punishment rates um, in the only violation treatment. Now, if there is an opportunity to help, what does happen? When the child is present, you see the, the parents they almost stop expressing directly their disapproval to the actor. So they no longer use direct punishment. It's only 5% or almost nobody is expressing direct disapproval. What happens when they are alone? It also reduces from 11% to 7%, but the difference is not significant. So it's only when the child is present that 
parents substitute indirect punishment for direct punishment. This result uh, helps us um, reject two alternative interpretations of the higher direct punishment in the presence of children. Because you could tell me, well, but if parents are um, more willing to implement direct punishment when the child is present, perhaps it's simply because they want to show their child that they are strong. So it's maybe simply driven by image concerns. If it was the case, if it was only driven by image concern, why would parents stop using direct punishment when they can withhold help? It's not consistent. So we, we reject an explanation in terms of image. The second um, thing that we can reject is perhaps people express more direct disapproval when the child is there because they simply believe that the child protects them against retaliation. We think it's exactly the opposite. If they stop using direct punishment when they can withhold help, it shows that in fact, if any, they have a, a, a higher fear of retaliation in the presence of the child. Otherwise, there's no reason to stop using direct punishment compared to when the child is not there. And so th this result, this substitution effect provides additional support to the teaching explanation. We have regressions, of course, to support our claims. Um, the main thing is that we basically the control variables are never significant, except for, for the gender of the, the, the male target is significantly higher. So the fathers are more willing to use direct punishment compared to the mothers. And we have in the helping context that uh, a, a male actor receives less help than the female actress. But for the rest, we have no, no effect of the number of witnesses. We have no effect of the, the wealth of the neighborhood, the weather, et cetera, nothing is significant. We have a lot of uh, uh, robustness tests in the, in the paper. I don't spend time to, to, to comment on this. Uh, we also report results of heterogeneity. Uh, basically, we don't find any effect of the child's gender. Uh, we find a small effect of age. Uh, in, specifically, we find that helping rate is higher when the child is below six years old. So it seems to suggest that uh, for younger, younger children, it's easier to, to, to teach the, the helping norm, uh, but not the, uh, not the indirect punishment. And so the, the effect of age is, the pure helping rate is slightly higher for the younger, youngest kids. Uh, the timing, the timing is, is important but we find no effect of timing. Let me just say a few words about it. You could tell me when you are with your child, uh, you, are, you are less in a hurry. I, I don't know why, but it could be the case that when you are alone, you have to rush more, but when you are with your kid, you, work, you walk more slowly, and so you pay more attention to the environment. And so to, 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 to have a proxy, of this, um, we, 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 we control in the regression for the, the time of arrival of the parent. We control for the rank of arrival at school, etc. And it's never significant. So we tried many things with, without interaction terms. It's never significant. And of course, when we designed the experiment, we avoided uh, parents who were visibly in a rush and we stopped playing the scene five minutes before the official time of the, the beginning of school, just to avoid this rush effect. So we, we, we are pretty confident that we are not measuring differences in terms of, uh, of rush or uh, of uh, yeah, time pressure. Now, the last thing is, uh, you could also tell me what we measure is not so much teaching. It's perhaps that the norm is not the same when, when a child is observing a violation. Perhaps 
parents consider that it's more serious. It's a more serious violation when a violation is, is, is done in front of a child, you can observe. And in that case, what we get is not the teaching effect, we get simply different perception of norms. So we, we, we conducted a vignette study online in 80 other schools in Lyon, um, and we elicited norms, um, uh, and we, we, we showed uh, the same three scenarios that, that we use in our field experiment, and we simply vary across participants the description of the scene mentioning the presence of the child or not. We had about 500 participants. And we find that the norms do not differ. So the, the violation is not seen as more inappropriate when a child observes. And the, the norm of uh, punishing a violator or the norm of helping someone who has dropped the content of his or her bag uh, are, are, are the same in, in, in all these environments. So we have no difference in the perception of the norms, depending on whether a child is present or not. So let me conclude. So what the field experiment shows you that uh, we, we, we observe a higher engagement of the parents in norm enforcement when a child is, is observing this, the situation. They are more likely to punish non-violators, they are more likely to help, they are not more likely to resolve help after a violation, but they are more likely to substitute uh, indirect punishment for direct punishment. And this is clear evidence of parental ed education as a vector of the transmission of, 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 of norms, of social norms. What is novel in our study is that it's not only modeling behavior, uh, it's teaching through punishing. It's teaching through punishing inappropriate behavior. How we interpret this? We reject that the presence of the child changes the perception of the norm. Uh, we reject that the results are driven by social image concerns because the, the presence of witnesses was never significant. Uh, of course, it would be interesting to test whether uh, parents would, would behave differently if they were walking together with a, a bystander instead of their child. That we didn't test it, it would be interesting to test. Um, we reject a lower fear of ret retaliation as an explanation of our results. Now, we, we, we acknowledge that uh, it, it's true that the parents may be different in the presence of their child. They may be more sensitive to the environment. They may pay more attention. They may have a different mindset. And this may affect the teaching. But it's part of our story, we believe. Now, of course, there are many extensions. Uh, we, we could investigate more the heterogeneity of, uh, of teaching, depending on the city, depending on the neighborhood, uh, depending on the families. Uh, indeed, we have only a relatively small proportion of people who are enforcing the social norms. And so the majority of people don't, don't do anything when they observe and when the child observes a norm violation. So it would be interesting to investigate uh, heterogeneity in this reaction. Uh, we observe, I said, the first part of transmission, but we don't know anything about the learning side. So it would be interesting to look for learning by children. And uh, finally, it may be interesting to look at whether uh, the, 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 this teaching by the parents correlates with the parenting style. I mean, are authoritarian parents more likely to, to teach by enforcing social norms um, compared to more permissive parents? We, we have no idea. So this is clearly something that could be investigated to, to understand better the, the teaching process. And I'm going to stop here to, to listen to your questions. Wonderful presentation, uh, Marika. Thanks so much. Uh, so we have a, a bunch of um, questions in the chat. Fabio is still taking care of them. So let me give Christina the floor to ask the first question, and I'll continue. Yes, thank you. Uh, I have uh, uh, two small questions and one more general. Thank you very much for the interesting research. Uh, when you say 
that uh, you can reject the hypothesis uh, that the presence of a child uh, changes uh, in the parents, the perception of social norm, uh, use the vignette. Uh, however, uh, the vignette uh, uh, is not just uh, the parent with the child, uh, is a parent with the child. And so um, in the case of the parent-child interaction, the real life interaction, I don't think uh, that the vignette result is really robust to what happens in real life. Sometimes it's very robust, but in this case, if you just present in the vignette, you know, the image of a parent with a child, and uh, you ask uh, in this condition uh, what you predict the parent will do, et cetera, et cetera, you know, the, the real life presence of a child would matter much more. So I don't think uh, you have really rejected that hypothesis. The second question, is about uh, external witnesses, okay? There are two possibilities when there are external witnesses. One is a reputation effect, you want you know, to look good, but the other, more often, unfortunately, is a diffusion of responsibility effect. So the more other people are around you, the less uh, uh, you help, for example, and probably uh, the less uh, you, uh, you know, condemn in practice uh, uh, littering. You know, there is a wonderful study on social psychologist Latin and Dudley about that. And uh, so I want to understand, uh, you, you talk a little bit about that, but if you really controlled for, uh, you know, how many people that are around, uh, the parent is there with the child, because parent alone versus parent versus child uh, is parent without child and parent with child, if I understand well. And instead, the issue is a parent with child and other people around uh, versus parent alone and other people around if there is a difference. And if there is a difference, you may say that in one case, there is a diffusion of responsibility. On the other case, you overcome uh, that kind of motivator and you want to teach a lesson. This is my second uh, question. The third is uh, more general. I really applaud. Uh, your interventions. Why? Because there is a big debate in developmental psychology. You know, it started with Turiel, who claim that there are crucial, almost innate differences in how children perceive norms. And for example, it shows uh, with lots of examples that children are ready to violate and not to condemn violation of convention versus, uh, you know, uh, they are not ready to violate a inverted commas moral norm like harming other children, beating them and so on and so forth. So they are ready to violate more conventional uh, norms and less ready to uh, violate more moral norms. And his view and many other people view is that there is a, a natural distinction, and uh, some cognitive psychologists claim that, uh, you know, like Chomsky theory of our natural capability to learn language, children were born with a natural capability of um, an ability uh, to uh, learn norms. You know, they are sort of embedded in us. And what parents do just what the society does is, uh, uh, you know, fit, um, uh, uh, fill in this moral grammar, but we are born with a moral grammar. Of course, I disagree, you know, my theory of social law, you can imagine why I disagree. And I think socialization matter. And I think your work is very important, you know, to show that. One thing, however, that I would like to see, you know, you use littering, etc., cetera, um, is uh, to distinguish the parents' behavior when a convention versus a sort of stronger norm is violated. Do we teach convention versus social norms in different ways to kid? Do we reward or punish differently for littering versus smacking other kids? So I'm very interested in how basically we develop very different understanding of different norms in uh, children, because in practice, they seem to be very sensitive to this difference when we do experiments with them. Thank you. 
Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Christina. It's uh, very rich comments and uh, it gives a lot of, uh, of ideas <laughs> for the future. The, the first point is about the, the uh, vignette. It's a very cold elicitation of, uh, of social norms versus our field experiment in which it's a hot elicitation of social norms. So uh, 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 I, I, I take the, the, the critique, it's, it's very true. So uh, we need to be more careful when uh, concluding that uh, the norm is the same based on exclusively the vignette study. Uh, it's, it's a very important point. Indeed, it could have been interesting to um, perhaps to elicit the social norm among the witnesses of the scene. So uh, doing the same <laughs> experiment yes. again and asking the, the, the witnesses, you look, look at this situation and, and what do you think? What do you think this person did? And that would have been, uh, yeah, you know, we are always, always more clever once the experiment is finished. <laughs> but I agree that we need to be more careful. Um, the second the witnesses. There are two, two effects. Um, for reputation, you may be more willing to, to enforce the norm. Uh, but on the other hand, you may uh, consider that it's uh, the job of other people to do this. Yes. Now, this is why when we staged the scene, we, we took we, we paid a lot of attention to make sure that um, no one else could intervene in the scene. So that um, there, there were, this is why we had only a few observations every day in, each, in, in the schools. Because we wanted that it was clear that the actor throw the banana peel and you are the only adult coming from the front. You see, there was no one else able to pick up. Of course, someone after you can do it, huh? that's true. But the witnesses are people on the other side of, of the street, you see. So there, there are people who can see you, but clearly they will not come and, and, and pick up the bag uh, at your place. So I believe more in the, 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 the our um, measure of witnesses is more, could be more a, an indicator of, of a, a concern for reputation. And what we find is it's never significant. Now, it's true that we need to include uh, interaction terms. It's, exact, it's, a, it's a very good suggestion. Uh, uh, taking into account the, whether the parents are alone or, or, or with the child, uh, whether uh, there are witnesses, etc., and, and look at the interaction terms. Yes. Absolutely. So I, I agree that we, we need to do that. And thank you very much for your general comment. I think it, it, it's it's really interesting. Of course, I, I believe more in the socialization uh, effect and the fact that we we teach our children we, as much as we can uh, social behavior, including social norms. But probably we don't teach the same way when it's about littering and we, when it's about uh, indeed aggressive behavior, violence, wearing masks. Um, and this is a, a, a playground, a play field. I mean, there are many, many things to do that could be manipulated uh, to try to isolate. What we, we really wanted to start with a, a, a standard norm violation that is easy to observe. Um, other type of violation involving violence. Well, with actors, we can do it. You can do it in a... In a uh, daycare <laughs> in uh, primary school uh, there are lots of fights children fight etc and how parents react there versus the littering uh, is very yeah. interesting or versus somebody a child uh, who dresses in a different way etc etc and we know children have very very different reaction and very curious about yeah, yeah. the socialization into that it's more complicated in terms of IRB because you need to have uh, children actors or you see it's more complicated but but I see your point I mean different types of violations with more social uh, social interaction in the, in the exactly 
so just in the interest of time, okay, we have a couple more comments. Let me just say that I posted in the chat also work by our colleague Nicholas Sambanis, who has done a field experiments in Germany. They've been using actors to show acts of discrimination, uh, also lit ring, but like more aggressive acts too. And so um, they published in PNES and AJPS, so these are papers that you might want to check out. And then also your paper seems to be closest to John Liss, Dan Hauser, right? The 2016 European Economic Review paper, right? What they use uh, cheating paradigm with kids and without kids. And they show that people are uh, sensitive to kids and they're more sensitive to uh, girls, I think, than they are to boys, right? So it, it seems, yeah. Yeah, absolutely right. But the difference is that in this paper, it's really about molding, modeling the behavior of the child. In our case, it's not only that, it's also teaching through norm enforcement, which was not at all. Yeah. The previous paper. Yeah. So Nicholas and Bannis, they do that also with punish withholding help uh, and not helping to pick up litter and all of these things. So they're actually doing also that. So I sent uh, Fabio the, the link so, okay. so you can check it out. Let me just give a chance for some more general questions that we asked. David, uh, David Hall, do you still want to ask him your question? Uh, sure. It's really a, a comment. Thank you. Uh, Mary Claire, thank you very much for this really interesting presentation. Um, this is not my area, but I do find it extremely interesting. Um, the, the, the observation that I had is something along the lines of your uh, one of your final comments that there is heterogeneity of, of teaching across cities and countries, etc. Um, I was really uh, wondering um, if you were to replicate this study in, say, Singapore, where littering is considered an egregious insult to society, but not only that, where you're highly likely to be fined and there are municipal fines, uh, someone's going to take out their cell phone, take your picture, and you're going to get fined, versus Calgary, Canada, where I live, where we also have fines. But if somebody pulls out their cell phone, other people are going to say, seriously, for littering, just pick it up and put it in the garbage for them. There's your teachable moment. But but the issue to me seems to be the, the researchable issue is to what degree do, do legislated uh, penalties influence teaching versus what I think my parent, my uh, children rather should know because I wish to have a, um, a, a clean environment. Thank you very much for, for the comment. Uh, I think it's, uh, well, it's an intuition because we didn't test it. But uh, I think that when there is a, a clear law that is um, uh, enforced, uh, parents may be less reluctant to, uh, punish, to directly punish violators because they can tell people, look, the, the law forbids doing this. And I think that it is one of the reasons why the, the smoking ban has been a, an immediate success in, in European countries, for example. We didn't believe that before, but once they introduced a smoking ban in restaurants, people started telling to other customers who, 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 who smoke, ah, let, the law has changed. You, you cannot do that anymore. So they could use the kind of pretext of the law to enforce direct punishment. So I think that indeed there is uh, there are interconnections between the existence of an explicit law that is uh, introduced and and enforced uh, compared to situation in which it's less less serious. So your comparison also between Singapore and, and Canada or Europe would be also very interesting for that reason. I, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Thank you. Great. So Ray has one quick question too. Ray, go ahead. Yes, uh, very interesting work, Marie Claire. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a totally naive question. So um, I'm just thinking about myself uh, when I'm with other people's children. So um, and about the 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 basically sort of causal relationship you're trying you're you're suggesting here, which is between parents and child. But I could. I could easily uh, envisage myself in the situation where I don't care about littering. So, I mean, uh, I would be walking along and somebody littered, I'd walk right by them, I couldn't care less. If I was with a child, they would bug me. They would say something to me about, oh, you know, somebody just littered, right? And uh, I would say, oh, well, I, maybe I need to do something, right? So I, I'm just wondering whether, what is the nature of the relationship? Like, uh, and maybe you recorded this with when you with the RAs, but I'm just wondering how much interaction there was between the sort of child and the parent 
when they were uh, encountering that situation? So of course it's difficult to measure precisely because we, we couldn't uh, stay at two meters from the parents. So it was difficult, but we tried to, uh, so the first RA had to try to listen to what was said. Huh? So it, it was at a very short distance. And um, so I cannot respond to what you, what you asked precisely, but uh, from the survey that we did, so we know whether the, the it is a parent, the adult is a parent of the kid or just a relative or a nanny. And uh, we find that 88% were the parents. And when we enter this variable in the regression, it's not significant. So we, we, we don't find that uh, non-parent accompanying the child teach less than the parent. We, we don't find significant effect of uh, the, the, the degree of link between the adults and the child uh, in uh, explaining the, the, the reaction of the, of the parents. Now we are also very cautious because we have uh, not many people who are simply nannies or, or relatives. And so we perhaps we lack power to identify this effect, but we, we don't find an effect. Great. All right, I think it's a good time to wrap up. Um, Marie-Claire, this was wonderful. Thanks so much for uh, being here with us virtually. Um, wonderful talk. Uh, Fabio, thanks so much for taking all the questions along the way. Um, Paulius, feel free to, uh, to conclude. Uh, yeah, thank you so much to the speakers and to everyone for joining. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we will see you in one week in our working paper series launch. So thank you so much and have a nice day. Thank you very much for your comments and suggestions. Thanks a lot. <laughs>